Um, thank you for having me. So I guess most, some of you might know that I did a talk here in 2018 under Superimpose, which is my previous agency. I opened with a friend of mine at the time called Toby Evans. <clears throat> the whole world has changed since then, so I'm back here to talk to you again. But yeah, Flock Together was born out of a really interesting moment. We're going to get into that. But I think it's really important to start from the beginning. Really, the intro of where it all began, why I became the type of creative that I am today. So I was about 23 and I was very lucky to be um, at, given a role at Poke, which was a creative agency at the time. One of the best creative agencies in the world, actually. And I was very young, very naive, too much confidence, maybe a bit arrogant. But I was very fortunate to be part on a campaign for Bernardo's, the children's charity. And we worked on a project called um, The Teen Speech. This was about giving young people around the country a voice, you know, listening to them, their hopes, their worries, their dreams, their desires, everything. But, you know, back then, it, this was 2009, by the way, young people had it tough. You know, they're very much, um, again, displaced like they are today. And my role was to travel around the country, really listening to their stories, to platform on Christmas Day. At the same time, the, tea, the Queen's speech was happening on my, this is my space, full takeover, that's how old I am. But yeah, the, um, the, the, on, on Christmas Day, the, the Queen did her speech. At the same time, the MySpace home page turned into a screen and we played this beautiful film that we'd made, again, voice, giving voice to this generation of young people. So for me, it was kind of a weird moment. That was my introductory, introduction to advertising or marketing. And seeing social impact at that level was an eye-opener to me. I'd always been interested in communications, always been interested in advertising, but never really understood the power it could f for good. So when I worked on that campaign, it really opened my eyes to think that, damn, we can make this space sexy, you know, we can actually support people through advertising. So for me, social impact was like locked in, cemented in my heart and it was really something I wanted to chase wherever I went. So then when I left that um, small job um, at 23 at Poke, I ran around the industry, I worked for lots of the agencies and the brands that we all know and love and some of you guys work at. And I just couldn't find my home. I did some incredible work, you know, namely working with Channel 4. I was part of a team that won a, um, an Emmy, which was very similar to that Bernardo's campaign, giving young people a voice. I was only young myself, but I think they saw me as kind of like the, the vehicle into that world, really helped them understand the minds of young people. But yeah, as I said, I couldn't really find my home. I turned up to these big, shiny offices. The only people that looked like me was the cleaner or the security guard. And I'd be in these rooms and be like, it just isn't me, you know, listening to how we ideate and listening to the stories we were telling, the references we were pulling from. I was just like, this ain't it. So then, yeah. So after um, like seven or eight years bouncing around the industry, I... Um, Decided to set up my home, you know, create it, basically. So Superimpose was born. Um, and yeah, back then we were like a new world creative agency challenging brands to go further. We're going to talk about Future Impose in a sec, but under Superimpose it was very much about seeing the industry as a, as a space for um, er experimentation, exp ex a space for innovation, a space for new perspectives. Whereas when I was working in all these places, I didn't find any of that. I didn't see anyone. It was very much on the outside looking in. Everywhere I went, I was just like listening to, again, the boardroom and being like, this doesn't, this doesn't feel authentic. And for me, everything had to be authentic. Authentic wasn't a buzzword for me and it still isn't to this day. It's not a buzzword. Um, so yeah, really saw an opportunity in regards to the industry does, needs to change. I wasn't wrong. I, the industry was wrong. I think it got very complacent. Um, you know, it lost its way, it got boring. And, f you know, again, in 2014, when we launched Superimpose, the world was changing. I think, you know, th the rise of social media, 
Um, digital communications was huge. So these big agencies that I worked at that were incredible at writing TV ads and TV scripts and then started had to think, you know, across multiple touch points, social, you know, PR, experiential, all of these other areas where they just struggled. So as an agency, we were like, we're going to be experts in all of those spaces. A truly diverse team equals better work. Facts. It's not even a debate anymore. I, I, I still really struggle to be in rooms where I look around the table or, you know, those multi-agency meetings that you have to have where everyone has to bring their team in. I'm just like, how are you guys doing work where you all look the same? You literally are telling the same stories. I don't get it. So for me, I've always prided myself of really trying to have a diverse team around me. I want to be challenged. If we're trying to speak to the widest set of people, then how in the world can I do that if everyone in my team is the same, has the same story to tell? So this was something that we've always pushed for. Truly diverse team equals better work. We also were at the time where big, age, big brands didn't need big agencies. You know, we needed to tell better stories. So it needed a nuanced approach. It needed specialist talent. A lot of these big agencies couldn't afford to have those types of people on their books 20, um, you know, on a full-time contract. So as an agency, we were really interested in those people that fought outside the box. We never really hired from within the industry. We wanted people that were free thinkers. You know, and again, we really pushed big brands to see that they didn't need big agencies and, you know, hold tight Adidas for being our founding client and doing some incredible work with. Um, but then at the same time, as you've heard, my, um, I guess, introductory years to advertising was, yeah, it wasn't really that joyful. I didn't make work that I'm super proud of. I tried, but it never happened to the level I expected anyway. So then when Superimpose was blowing up, sorry, I'm going to burp, this Heineken's gassy. <laughs> oh, good, we're good, we're good, sorry. <laughs> um, so then, so yeah, after a few years at, um, at Superimpose, working for some incredible clients outside of Adidas, but all in that fashion and lifestyle space, I wasn't satisfied of just delivering client work. I was like, this isn't what I got into this space for, you know? So... We really wanted to challenge and push the industry to be better. So we did this by, you know, not just solely focusing on client work, but pushing to do work that was completely independent, funded by ourselves, and then Services Unknown was born. So here we did events, thought pieces, we launched products, but very much about using creativity to push very important messages. I'm, some of my team here today, and we talk about all the time, I'm like, okay, cool, our role as creatives is to take the complex and make it relatable, make it reach as many people as possible. So yeah, I, I learned a lot about that, and I was able to, I guess, harness a lot of that through services unknown. So then, yeah, moving towards today, I look back at my career and all of the stuff I've done and the brands I worked with and the spaces I existed in, and I pretty much can sum it up. I was a menace, you know? <laughs> I was with someone the other day and they were like, we were talking and, you know, they were like, Ollie, you're just like, your career's just been about agitation. You're an agitator. And I was like, oh, I like that. But then at the same time, I was like, that's blatantly in everyone's decks at the moment is the next buzzword or disruptor as it was before. So for me, it's simply be a menace, you know, be in a space where I can be a pest. And if the gatekeepers are annoyed, then you're doing something right. So yeah, as I said, it worked. The industry, you know, listening to some of the people that have spoke before me today and speaking to some friends in attendance tonight, the industry looks very different to what it did five years ago. You know, it, not five years, it's seven years because we lost two years of our lives in the pandemic. But seven years ago, it looked very different when we launched Superimpose. You know, we had incredible success. We worked on insane, you know, still to this day, think about some of the, the campaigns we launched, some of the partners we worked with. And it's, it blows my mind that we were able to do that as a really small independent shop. But I ain't going to lie, I ain't going to sit here and say it was all roses. We definitely lost our way. This was 2020, just before 2020, and we all know what happened that year. But um, we lost our way, and 
One piece of advice someone gave me that I completely ignored was with scale comes problems. I was like, nah, I worked at some great agencies, some huge agencies, you know. They, they had seven offices around their world. They sold for 14 million after a few years. I was like, that's surely the way you've got to do things right. <laughs> Not even. So, um, yeah, when I ignored that, I look back now and I wish I, you know, I kept superimposed nimble and small. But, you know, we got so... I guess not complacent, the industry got complacent. We weren't the new kids on the block that were like the disruptors anymore. There was lots of those, we inspired lots of those. So, um, so yeah, for, for me, at 20, when 2020 came around and we started to lose our clients, it gave me the opportunity to really think, or the opportunity to go back to our core and to really focus on what made us stand out. So yeah, in, in a 2020 world required a new mission. It wasn't really about hoping and remixing the old. It really needed something bigger. We talked to Matt introduced me as, you know, the constant evolution, and it really is that. It has to be constantly e evolving. The world changes every single day, but why do we as, you know, as an industry feel that we have to be stagnant? We, sh we, don't, we should always push for more. So then Rebirth was what we called the launch of really Future Impose. Something that really, you know, I guess grounded us in what we were great at, being, bringing social impact to the fore. You know, when, you know, in the earlier years, I, used, I heard the term corporate social responsibility. I had no idea what that meant. I was, that's a bit of a long mouthful. But anyway, turns out that corporate social responsibility was what brands kind of had at the last page of their website, hidden away, or the last page of their deck. The HRT might address it. But, but what it really is, and what we're seeing today, is corporate social responsibility is the most important thing as a brand you hold. You know, talking about a spinning shoe on a plinth is only going to get you so far. So if we can't tell stories, uh, you know, and use the power of brands to platform marginalized groups, then you really are living on borrowed time in the world we live in today. So Rebirth was our, our North Star, what guided us. It's on our Future Imposed website. You can go and read it now. It's really well written. I didn't write it. I can't claim it, but it explains this a lot better than I'm doing. But social impact is more important than ever today. As it doesn't really need explaining. Social impact is so much, is needed on a level that we never wanted to see. Like I said, 2008, I was traveling the country listening to kids talk about how hard they had it. And it, it, it broke my heart listening. But today, it's, it's worse. It's so much worse. So if someone was to do a teen speech today, I would be so shocked to hear the stories if you travel outside of our bubble in London and hear how hard people really have it. So again, what does social impact mean though? Because we are in danger of as an industry, you know, I guess using that term as what we've seen sustainability being turned into. It's a nothing word now, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but social impact really is there and for us, there's a few things that we want to kind of ensure we're doing when it comes to social impact. Firstly, can we look at resource reallocation? I, again, throughout my career, and I'm not boasting, but I've seen some mad budgets. Crazy. And <laughs> was that Nena laughing? What was <laughs> no, but um, yeah, I saw mad budgets. So I was like, oh my God, for what? This budget is ridiculous to, to launch a little trainer that, you know, or to, to create a piece of content that people are going to scroll past in seconds. I'm like, uh, for real? So as an agency, we really look at resource reallocation. Is there ways that we can use corporate funding to step in in regards and replace of traditional funding? Governments and institutions have let us down, left, right and centre. We've got the biggest cuts to youth services the world's ever seen, but we're still using all this money to create nonsense. So yeah, resource reallocation is something that as an agency we really try and push our clients to, to consider. Community empowerment. Again, something that is just part of me. Um, so, you know, the need to support each other, create space where ideas can be shared and protected, doing all this with a common goal. We were talking as a team last week and, you know, there's all this talk about community this, community that. I get a lot of people asking me, how do you start a community? You know, and community organisation. 
And it really isn't about that. Community is about just making space for people to come together and spend time together. Like the rest will come, but firstly ensure you're creating a safe space, nurturing space, and then for real, anything's possible. Creativity is problem solving. And again, I really want everyone in this room to really deep this. This is something that as an industry, the most incredibly influential industry out there, so creative. Can we start using that skill set in ways that's going to add values, in ways that's going to find solutions, much needed solutions? Um, a quick story before we move forward. So, in, you know, running an agency was hard. We went from two, two dudes in a basement to 35 staff, you know, launching satellite offices in LA and New York. And I went from just being a creative to then having to realize how to create an, a an agency, you know, the business side of it, the team management. And managing people is one of the hardest things you're ever going to do. And I remember when it got really intense and I'd really struggle. Um, I also had ADHD or have ADHD. I was under diagnosed for a long time, but got diagnosed last year. And, you know, don't get me wrong, we're, you know, we're all on that spectrum somewhere. But for me, I always used to sit, in, sit at my desk and really struggle with certain briefs or something. And I started going out into nature and just thinking, okay, cool, I'm not breaking, I'm not cracking this, you know, concept, but you know, I need to escape, I need a new scenery. So I'd go on these long walks, and before you know it, before I knew it, I was coming off these walks and being like, nailed it. Literally, everything in my head felt so clear. Um, so I became addicted to this sort of space where I could really feel grounded, really gain perspective, really be inspired. You know, and Nadim, who I set up Flot together with, he couldn't make it today, but, you know, something he's always said about nature about being in those spaces, it's the one space that lets you just be. And that might sound a bit weird, but truly think about it. You know, even here tonight, can you just be? Do you feel a social need to talk or network or, you know, be a certain person? When you're in nature, there's nothing required of you. The trees aren't asking you to be on time. The lakes aren't saying, clock in or deliver this. And it's true, and, and as flock grows, we get, when we unpack this more and more, it really is something that all of it, you know, I implore all of you guys to seek because it's helped me be the person I am today. It's the reason I'm here. So then, yeah, based on that, you just heard a personal need that led to the creation of Flock. So I'd been bird watching for 10 years at this point now. And I, you know, again, like I just said, I'd go into these green spaces and just come back so grounded, like everything. You know, if I was having issues in my personal life, hit nature, work, hit nature, come back, you know, revitalized. So then understanding the benefits that nature has given me and then meeting Nadim, like a pure serendipitous meeting, we both realized that we've got these insane benefits from nature and we need to share this with a community. And in 2020, all of us were having to face up to mental health on a level we none of us asked for. So, so when I, I met Nadim, I was just like, I've got this idea for a bird watching collective, you know, and I think our community right now, because in the black community, we, mental health's a bit of a taboo. You don't, you have to firm it, just get on with it. You can't go to your parents and be like, oh, I'm feeling a bit, nah. <laughs> nah, I don't run in an African household at all. And also, I was very lucky to be a part of some of the incredible um, community groups that we'd seen, you know, Hold Tight, Charlie Dark, and Run Dem Crew. I was very fortunate to be a part of the, you know, the building of that incredible uh, um, space. I'm not a social runner. I, c I have to be silent. But l seeing how empowered people were within that gave me the idea that maybe Flock Together in Nature could do with a space like that. Three years later... Flock is still to this day so overwhelming. If I could let you see my inbox and the opportunities that come our way, it is mind blowing. And I've been fortunate to work on, again, incredible brands, incredible um, talent over the years. Nothing comes anywhere close to the response that I've received from Flock Together. Old, white, I know, old, young, black, white, left, right, absolutely everyone who comes across Flock is just like, how can we be involved? How can I support it? Go you. It's incredible. You know, we've gone, gone from having 
a regular TV show on the BBC to letters from the Prime Minister. I'm not going to say which one. Um, <laughs> you, know, uh, uh, you know, everything that's happened over the last three years is still to this day overwhelming. But when we set out, it was very important to set out with a mission. You know, it wasn't just about, okay, a group of people in the outdoors trying to support each other. I was very strict on our like, if we're going to do something, what? we have to be strict with it. We have to have a strategy behind it. So I remember inviting a lot of people around my, a few of the early members around my house and we're just like, okay, cool, what is this? There's something special going on, but what is it? So we sat down and figured out what was, what was our mission here? What was the most important thing we can do in this space? And that, this is it. Challenge the underrepresentation of POC in the outdoors. It was weird. The comments we used to get when they used to be, you know, 20, 30, 40 of us walking around some of the parks, the green spaces, and they were crazy. A group of people with binoculars looking in the sky. Oh, what are the binoculars for? Oh, what are you using them for? Like, it was crazy. I was like, why are we getting these comments? Why can't we just be, like I said before? So looking now, fast forward three years later, mission completed. Globally now, there is a movement in regards to marginalised groups who never felt welcome in these spaces that are your birthright, um, our birthright, you know, they're everywhere. And, you know, we played our part in really pushing that mission. And, you know, it's great to never see them comments now. It's you're still more comments of encouragement than anything. So, but again, some of the stuff we had to go through in, that, in, in, in approaching that was... And again, I've summed it up here. Don't tell us to fit into a broken system. And again, the reason I gave you that spiel at the start about my career journey was because it was the same in advertising. I was like, this system doesn't work for me. It was like trying to put on a shoe that wasn't designed for you or wasn't your size. It was just like, something isn't right here. Um, so with advertising, I wanted to be a menace. I wanted to open this space so everyone can benefit. Um, it wasn't easy, and it still isn't easy. I think, you know, we are also, um, I guess, in danger of presenting this space as it looking easy. You know, people think, oh, you're making all these brands, you work with, you've been killing it. I'm like, are you crazy? Why are we out of pocket? Um, and corporate sponsorship is something, and when I say talk about don't tell us to fit into a broken system, you know, people are saying, oh, Ollie, set up as a charity. I'm like, do you know the hoops you have to jump through to set up as a charity? Like, you know, under-supported community groups that need funding more than probably Flock does, they have to hire funding managers to be able to write these forms to get... It just doesn't make sense. And we worked with one of the biggest charity funders in the country called um, Esme Fairburn. And we just told them it's really not set up for people to benefit from what you guys were originally meant to do. So for me, working in this space with all of these brands, it made sense for me to consider corporate sponsorship. We're very, very strict in regards to how we work with brands. It isn't a partnership. We don't call them collaborators. It's like we come up with the concept and brands, you support our ideas. You know, we don't want to be flavor of the month. I remember in the first year of Flock, literally every week I was on a call with one of the brands every week marketing manager and it was just like you guys are all flavor we're flavor of the month if you guys are all this keen in a year's time then great so I'm very strict on saying if you want to engage us two year minimum two year minimum I want to see what you're, you're, you're looking to do with us for two years so all of these learnings were what we had to take into building flock to what you see it is today but yeah community first if you have a community, then truly anything is possible. No one can say anything to you if you've got a community su you know, supporting you. Keep platforming voices and keep speaking to the marginalised groups. You know, don't lose your way. Don't see the fame. Don't see in the lights. We've had you know, issues over the years where people have came in and tried to get involved for the wrong, right, wrong reasons. We are servants and more than anything, we're serving our community. And something we talk about as a team is behavior over values. Don't, comp don't like, um, judge me on what I do, not what I say. I, I can stand here all day long and talk through m loads of slides, but if I'm not out there actually delivering, then it's all gas. So please judge us on our behaviors, not what we've got in our decks as values. And yeah, always, always use creativity to reach more people. And over the years, we've done lots of that. It, we've done that in different ways. If it's not um, an editorial talking about 
the favourite and most, also the most hated bird in London, the parakeet. You know, what we try to do there is really compare language used around describing the um, parakeets as language used to describe our parents when they came over. You know, invasive alien species, all of that sort of stuff. Non-native, I'm going to burp, sorry. I'm not going to burp. <laughs> um, you know, non-native, all of these things. So we, what we did is that, it's a really important message, but we use creativity to present this editorial in a way to educate people um, about this issue and always also celebrating these beautiful birds that are was so resilient. They came from the Himalayas, by the way. Incredible journey. And, or it was the flock book that we wrote and, and, and um, launched last year. And one of the hardest things I've ever done, I'm not a writer. It was so hard to write. You know, writing decks for brands and copywriting is one thing, but having to put your heart and soul on a piece of paper that to make sense over 6,000 words per chapter was a challenge. But we did it, and I was very proud of being able to build billboards where, again, we could use our creativity to push this message. And on these billboards, what, you got, what we did was we created a, a post out. So for the locals, local area, people could tear this poster off and see top 10 birds they can find in their area, how to find them. Added it, you know, a little bit of editorial around it so it made it a bit interesting. And I remember going back and thinking, someone's just going to take them all off. It's not going to work. We got photos. But no, every day you could see people were actually engaging with this. And again, using creativity to push, that, push an important message. Or our music series. You know, during lockdown, we were all forced to work from home. So we started to consider our environments more. You know, how can we work in a space which wasn't designed for work? So I think... One insight we were given when we were approached by um, the distribution company to, if we wanted to make a compilation was that rain became the fourth most popular genre in the world. Rain. Rain. Mad. So, um, <laughs> so we were asked to put this compilation together to really, you know, um, use nature sounds as a as an important space for whether you're working, whether you're struggling to sleep. Because, yeah, jo again, during 2020, it was really tough. So yeah, creativity is always going to be important. So where next though? Um, yeah, and this is where it hopefully gets a bit sexier. Sorry if that got deep. Um, so phase two is now about bringing POC creativity to nature. Um, when I met Nadim, I was very much inspired by his take on nature. I don't know anything about nature. I can't tell you every, I can probably tell you most birds in the UK if we spot them, but outside of that, I can't name the trees. I can't name, you know, you know, I don't know, migration, migratory patterns, any of that. But when I listen to Nadim, he, he's got a lot of this information, a lot of this knowledge and the way he presents it in that, in that way with personality and Conviction. I was like, we need to hear more of you guys. If I had you as my geography teacher, things would change. So, um, so what, what, what I took from listening to Nadine was that if you consider the conservation conversation, the same people have been saying the same thing to us for a long time. We talk about the climate crisis, but we're still seeing, again, the same people say the same things. You're not reaching anyone. We're not having any more impact than we, and we desperately, desperately need it. So with bringing POC creativity to nature, I really hope that we can start to hear new perspectives. We can start to inspire people on a level that we haven't done before, reach people that have never considered the climate. And remember, there is those people out there. Remember the echo chamber that we're all in. Let's be very careful that we don't get stuck in this echo chamber. How do we break out of that? So platforming new perspectives is something that I'm very important, that is very important to me. And then if you look at POC creativity in other spaces, whether it's music, fashion, sport, the obvious ones really, when people of colour are allowed to thrive, everyone benefits. Again, that's a fact. That's not my word, that's a fact. So with that, you know, we're very excited to launch a new position for Flock, and that is New Nature. And when we see, when I say new nature, this, this came to me in a mushroom trip, and I said trip, that it could be just a walk in nature. <laughs> it was that, actually. 
<laughs> but, but with new nature, what, what, when it came to me, I was like, why has Flock been so successful? Why has it had such appeal in this space? And I just gave it so much thought. And I think what made it, it interesting is not only the difference between me and the demon, our, both, our perspective and our passion for nature, even though we're very much in different like, levels in regards to our knowledge, what makes it great is that, and also what you know, Flock has done is, Flock's very much about inviting people to nature. A lot of the people that come to our walks are first timers. We do not dictate your experience. I can't say to you, hey, come to Flock and this is what you're gonna take away from it. Every single person has a unique experience. So it made me think is that, and then it got me to thinking that my nature, or let's say your nature, isn't my nature. And that's what's great about nature. You know, for too long, the gatekeepers has made us consider the outdoors is this, nature is that. You have to be this person. That's all bullshit. Again, gatekeepers ruining it for everyone. So when I came across new nature, I was very much about how can we ignore the gatekeepers in this space and really use this term as a way to invite absolutely everyone, everyone into the space. Whatever you're interested in, nature has a space for you. Nature will inspire you. And I really feel that if we can push this message, we might start reaching the people that have been left out of this very important conversation for far too long. Different messages for different people. It's that simple. Everyone has a part to play. I'm not up here saying that person's stuff's over there wasn't very good or this person's stuff. The more I want everyone doing more because we need different messages to speak to different people. And then... Who knows, we might have the person, we might be able to uncover this someone who has that answer that's going to save us all. Said this already. Um, but yeah, platforming new perspectives is the only way. Um, and then also, make it sexy. You know, it, it, I've been trying to think of a better way to frame this, but I can't make it sexy it's that simple um again we're what you know I'm, a bas I'm an ambassador at RSPB um I'm also an ambassador of the I always get this wrong WWT Wet, Wildlife and Wetlands Trust and I'm not lying when I sit on these calls with them I'm like why are you so boring <laughs> what, there is no reason you have to be this boring at all and then it makes me think, it's because we've not been invited in. And I'm not saying just me as well, or as people of colour, creatives. You know, the skill sets you all sit on. There's so many places of importance that need your creativity. So yeah, if you guys have got a better way I can frame this, help me out. But make it sexy. Um, also, common goal. Motive, and this is a direct quote. I sent my um, creative strategist, Rahani, she's sitting down here. Um, this morning, we were in a call, we were in a meet, meeting last week, a very big partner meeting with someone for Flock, and I would think I was hungover, and I was babbling, that I've been doing now today. And, you know, I said something, and I paused. I was like, shit, yeah, that didn't come out well. And then Rahani just jumped in, and it was about this common goal. And she said, motivating people to be connected to nature, and then from that place of emotion, be bonded and motivated to take action. You know, with so many people, you know, we're all to blame. We sometimes think, oh, it's overwhelming. I can't even deal with that. I can't contribute. So I'm just going to turn off. That ain't it. And we have to change that. So for us, the common goal for Flock is the more people we can get involved in this conversation, the better in the, in the long run. There's going to be a solution. There is going to be a good result that we all benefit from. And then for me, this quote is what I live by it directs everything I do and I saw it at a, an exhibition I think it was a Whitechapel, Whitechapel gallery many many years ago and it stopped me in my tracks and I returned to it all the time it's from an aboriginal, aboriginal activist groups in the 70s and it says if you come only to help me you can go back home but if you consider my struggle as part of your struggle for survival then maybe we can work together we have to be intersectional in everything we do when when you win, I win. And when I win, you win. That's how we should be looking at. I hope no one's in this audience being like, okay, cool, that's great for them over there. Those people of colour, they, that's great for them, but it's not really for me. That's not the attitude that's going to get us anywhere. We're all in this together. 
Who said that? Was that is that uh, is that Labour? <laughs> hey, I'm hey, I'm all red. I am all red, but please. Ah, sorry, that's not even in my notes either. Anyway. But this quote is really important, you know, if you ain't really here to understand that, if you, if you help me, you will win. You know, it's not see me as a charity case. It's not see this space as a charity case. And finally, just, yeah, another reminder, creativity is problem solving. Going back to this room, you're so much talent in here. You tell incredible stories. Can we use all that to find a solution to this real you know, drastic situation we find ourselves in with the climate. And join the mission, I mean, thank you. (laughs) 